as we're getting nearer and nearer to the end of this course, we're also getting nearer and nearer to Nibbana in this uh, talk, so that's very fitting, isn't it? Now, yesterday I explained the um, aspect of seeing the unsatisfactory nature of all that is conditioned and compounded and having and directing the mind towards that which is unconditioned. That which is unconditioned and uncompounded, if we see that which is compounded and conditioned, we know that there has to be there have to be bits and pieces, the compounds to make it a whole, and the conditions have to be there. So if we are looking, if we see that that's not satisfactory, then we have to look for that which is the exact opposite not compounded, not conditioned. And if it's not compounded and not conditioned, what can it be? Now, obviously, the mind that hasn't had that experience yet doesn't know what that is. But that doesn't matter. The mind knows at least that it doesn't want that what it's always had so far. And what it knows it has always had is it always had the occurrence of defilements and it had always had the signs, the experience of the aggregates. It it knows that. It knows that it has had aggregates. It's aware of the aggregates. And it knows of the it knows the defilement. So obviously it doesn't want any of that. So by turning one's back on that which one knows, one is turning oneself toward that which one doesn't know. Which is good enough. It's that simile of the land finding crow. The crow doesn't know where the land is but it knows it doesn't want to be on, or it's not supposed to be on the ship. So it's got to go. And from a practical standpoint, this is best done after the jhanas and the experience of the mind that is turning away from all that it knows, including the jhanas, because they're also conditioned, obviously, there's a condition there. There's a condition of concentration and all sorts of conditions actually to make them happen. So it turns itself away, the mind, from all that, what it knows. And it goes toward that or directs itself, makes a direction toward that which it doesn't know, which has no compound, no condition, and it said it has no occurrence in it, which is quite a good sentence. Let's see if that I find that sentence. Yeah. That which is non, no occurrence. I can't find it right now. No, I hear this. Um, The consciousness, while traversing the reflections back and forth, transcends the continuous occurrence of formations. Everything that's compounded, everything that has our conditions is a formation, particularly mental formation, and alights upon non-occurrence. Now that's a good sentence to know there is a point where the mind goes to where there's nothing occurring, non-occurrence. 
one who, having practiced rightly, has alighted upon non-occurrence, O king, is said to have realized Nibbana. So I use the word still point. It doesn't really matter what word one uses, uh, uses. The thing that one has to know is that we turn ourselves away because we have total dispassion, total disenchantment, total dispassion for everything that exists, desire for deliverance, and have seen that within that which we know, deliverance from Dukkha is not possible. So therefore we need to go somewhere else with the mind. And having that direction and having been concentrated enough, the mind can do it. It is a matter of concentration. A concentrated mind, and therefore a mind who can practice jhanas, has, of course, a much uh, greater possibility for doing that because it's already concentrated. (coughs) And we also know that all the time this practice has been done for one reason only, and that is for the total elimination of dukkha. So obviously, having seen quite clearly that within the things we know, there is no elimination of dukkha. It's not possible. There is momentary respite from dukkha, momentary relief, but there is no elimination. So, obviously, the mind goes in a different direction. And it goes towards that which can be called the still point, a point an et, a point of concentration where there's nothing at all. The only thing it has in common with jhana experience is the concentration. Other than that, in the jhana experiences, we have an observer, one who can tell afterwards, yes, I had this and I had that and I was experiencing this and I was doing this. It can always tell afterwards. In this, when there is non-occurrence, there can also be no observer. Nothing is occurring. It's, um, and you can't even, one can't even say it's nothingness because that would already giving it a a description. It's non-occurrence. And I use the word still point. Um, I think both of those have at least some connotation. And the actual um, experience of it will have to be experienced by everyone themselves. When it is experienced, it's usually quite clear that one has experienced something which one can't even describe. And not because it's indescribable, because it's so magnificent or anything like that. No, it's indescribable because there wasn't any observer there. There's nobody there. So it's really and truly being nobody going nowhere. And because of that, not being able to describe it, the next moment which is the fruit moment, is the important one, because that one can describe. And sometimes there have been misunderstandings on that too, I thought everything else, that it takes time till it happens or something like that. It's immediate. The uh, past moment is one mind moment. The fruit moment is two, in some cases three. So it's also very brief, but at least we are there to tell what happened. And the the fruit moment follows immediately the past moment. It has to. They belong together. And one of the things which seems to be a general 
always recurring experience is a great feeling of relief. But that, of course, in itself is not quite enough. I don't want to go into all the details of that, what is experienced, because it is quite possible sometimes to imagine if one knows the words. So it's better not to know all the words, but to experience it. But relief is one of the very common uh, descriptions, that and other words, of course, as if one has shed an enormous burden. Now, a jhana meditator knows already that in order to have the benefits and the pleasure and the experience of jhana, the me has to be shed for the time being, for the time of the jhana. So one has already the pathway open. Oh, but of course it is necessary to see the unsatisfactoriness of everything before one is willing to no, not before one is willing, one is very willing, one wants to get rid of dukkha. Before one is able to have the past moment. You see, the thing is, everybody is perfectly willing to give up their dukkha. But that's not enough. One has to also be willing to give up the one who is experiencing dukkha. And if one gives up the one that's experiencing dukkha, one is of course also giving up the one who is apparently having this great, wonderful resultant of Nibbana. So one's got to be able to give it up. So that ability to give up comes from two causes. One is the concentrated mind, where the mind's really one-pointed, concentrated, and from profound insight, from all the steps on the pathway which we have already discussed and which, as one practices them, become deeper and deeper until it's impossible to negate them at any moment. They're always there. Now, one doesn't always put one's mind on them, but the minute one puts one's mind on Anicca Dukkanata, any one of them, it's all clear. The Buddha was once asked whether he is omniscient. And he said, no. Not no, he doesn't know everything all the time. He knows that on what he puts his mind. And it's the same, and he also described a man or a person who has attained Nibbana by saying that such a person, now mind you, when the Buddha says attained Nibbana means fully enlightened, we're going to see how there are steps on that. He says it's like a person who had his feet and hands cut off, but only knows that when he puts his mind on that fact. So even having attained Nibbana, one knows that only when one puts one's mind on. But what one experiences all, at, all the time is a reduction of the defilements. And that reduction of defilements is gradual. And I'll explain that in its gradual progression. First, there's a nice simile also about the result of having this past moment, which it says that it that at the past moment, well, well, I think one should say at the fruit moment because at the past moment one can't do a thing. At the fruit moment, well, it says the past consciousness accomplishes four function in a single moment. That's right. The past consciousness ex uh, has four functions, but you can't know them until one moment later. Is that clear that the past moment is one which, so to say, 
one doesn't even know anything. But the fruit moment knows what has happened. And because it's a very strong impact, every past moment either eliminates or reduces defilements. They're called fetters. And it also, the, the past moment, the past consciousness also has the effect of making the Four Noble Truths, all of them, completely clear. And it's compared to the sun. When the sun rises, the uh, darkness disappears, and at the same time, light appears and cold is eliminated and we can see things so when the sun comes up we have four benefits and the same thing happens when the past consciousness comes about because four things happen namely those four of the four noble truths we understand the truth of suffering completely there's never any doubt again ever that what is happening in the world is dukkha now again the word suffering can be used but I rather say it's not it's unsatisfactory we have we see that forever there's never again a, a question about it that maybe there could be something somewhere that would be not uh, unsatisfactory would be satisfying for more than a moment and also one sees exactly the origin of that dukkha that it's the wanting and the wanting means this the three wantings the wanting or craving for sensual gratification and the craving to be and particularly it's a craving to be which makes so much trouble not only does it mean a lot of work to keep the body going but the craving to be encompasses all our difficulties when we have the feeling of emotional put down when we're not being cared for, appreciated, loved, praised it's all that craving to be the craving to be is this is the originator of all dukkha and it's not necessarily only the physical to be because we very often don't have any problem physically to be I mean there's nobody's attacking us here quite all right here we're quite in safe actually I mean, the doors are closed and there's nothing it's not even a siren going so it's fine but that doesn't prevent us from having the craving that our ego consciousness should be supported that the others should also um, commit themselves to go along with us or not even more than that so that's also craving to be so we have all our dukkha comes from the fact that we have that and the craving for sensual gratification and then it penetrates the truth of the noble eightfold path and it is said that the other hand, the fully enlightened, is the Noble Eightfold Path. Not only penetrating it, but being so imbued with it that all the aspects of the Noble Eightfold Path are never, ever lost for a moment, wherever such a person puts his or her mind on. It's always available. And, of course, number three is penetrated, Nibbana, cessation, cessation of suffering. 
So those four noble truths which are um, uh, like a telegram style of the whole of the teaching, at the moment of, uh, of having the path consciousness makes the mind able to see those four quite clearly. And again, it's um, the first one is the understanding of the, of the dukkha. The second one is the abandoning. Because at the moment of past consciousness, we have to abandon the craving to be. And that is, of course, the difficulty. We won't mind being rid of dukkha. In fact, we think it's great. We don't mind getting Nibbana. Wonderful, why not? Something new has been added. But to give up everything, that's a different story. So at the moment when, in order to get a past moment, there has to be this abandoning of the craving to be. For no other reason that inside has come that there is nobody here that can be that it's just strictly a matter of phenomena which have arisen and are going to cease and are rising and ceasing. So that's the first one is the understanding of dukkha, the second one is the abandoning, and then we have number four, which is the Noble Eightfold Path, is the developing, and number three is the realizing, the realizing of Nibbana, which is even more telegram style, just four words. Understanding, abandoning, realizing, developing. This is the only difficulty, abandoning. And that's why I keep saying the whole of the spiritual path is letting go. That's all it is. There's nothing to get. It's all to get rid of. Because the more we get rid of, of course, the more we get something else. But if we want to get something, we're surely not going to get it. Now, there are four, yes, there are four past moments possible. And the first one is called stream entry, and it abandons the first three fetters. We have ten fetters altogether. The word fetter is a good word because it, it sort of chains us, chains us to this existence. And these first three fetters, which are abandoned, give us an, a different, um, different worldview. They are we are, we are abandoning wrong view of self. Now, in the case of a stream enter, when he has once gone across that stream and landed on the other side, such a person does not have an empty feeling within all the time. There's no such thing as being totally without self for a stream enter. Because to be totally without self means that there would be absolutely no defilements. If there's no self, nobody could possibly have any craving or any hate. Nobody there to have it. No irritation, no dislike. No worries, no fears, nothing. So a stream enterer doesn't have that. A stream enterer has right view of self if he or she puts the mind on who am I right view of self arises I am nothing but a phenomena of mind and body which has causes has arisen from causes and will dissolve something like that will be the answer but only when the question is asked. Otherwise, a stream enterer still has a feeling of that he or she is walking around 
knows exactly who's waking up in the morning just like everybody else and uh, has ideas and certain wishes and um, desires to do things and so nothing has changed in that respect but the understanding of self has changed completely when one puts one's mind on the other thing that is gone is any kind of skeptical doubt there is a complete and utter devotion to Buddha Dhamma Sangha because obviously it's true one has oneself been able to prove it it's possible to have this one moment where everything stops and then the fruit of it which is quite exhilarating and it's a very it's an it's a moment which one never forgets it's a, a peak experience so there's no doubt no doubt at all that the Buddha knew what he was talking about and that this is the only way a person who has had stream entry through learning the Buddha's pathway can never take another teacher has total devotion but as I said before, there's, it is possible to get to enlightenment without having the Buddha's pathway. But the steps taken are the same, but it, one doesn't necessarily use the Buddha for that. But having used the Buddha, one has total devotion. One also has total self-confidence, self-assurance, because one knows one can do it. One knows that there is the ability in oneself to transcend the worldly, the mundane. And with that self-assurance, one doesn't vacillate. Should I do this or should I do that? Would it be better to... Um, maybe I should uh, learn Tai Chi or maybe I should uh, work with crystals or maybe it's very important to know all about astrology or who knows what one else thinks these ideas what one has as a complete confidence that one knows exactly this is it that's what I'm going to do and this self, self-assurance this self-confidence is extremely helpful because there's a, it isn't a superiority feeling at all it's not possible anymore, the superiority feeling. Um, because uh, one has seen what, is, what the person really is. But it's a feeling of um, being on the right path. So it's confidence in oneself and in Buddha Dhamma Sangha. And the third thing is that one doesn't believe in rites and rituals. Now that's usually understood to be religious rites and rituals. And that's what it usually is meant to. But we don't in the West have, don't believe that anyway. That the rites and rituals are going to get us enlightened. In the East, there's a lot of that. If you don't prostrate so many times, or if you don't prostrate in the right way, or if you don't do it this way or that way, then uh, it's not going to work. So there's a lot of um, clinging to certain rites and rituals. Now it doesn't mean that one can't do these rites and rituals at all. It doesn't mean that. What it means is that one has given up the idea that any of them will bring one to enlightenment. Any of them. That they may be something to help one with one's devotion, maybe something that could help one even with one's uh, physical well-being. I mean, a thousand prostrations should be very good for one's physical well-being. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, but it's certainly never believed anymore that there's anything in a ritual that can bring enlightenment. Because there isn't. The only thing that can bring enlightenment is insight. Seeing the things as they really are. Now, we also have 
rites and rituals in the West which we adhere to. And that is the way we think we one should live. We have a very, some people have very exact ideas how everything should work and um, how our relationships should work. That, uh, and we have judgments about others that aren't like that, that are different. And that goes. We can see that there's nobody there. People are just doing things. It's all just a passing show. So the judgments of that other people are doing it wrong. Wrong practice or wrong rituals or wrong way of living. That's not there because one doesn't believe that they have any intrinsic value, the rituals. One can do them, and people will do them, because they are helpful, um, not just for the physical well-being, but they are also helpful for one's, for remembering, for reminding ourselves. Man and his symbols, we are reminded. So it is helpful that way. But they can't bring enlightenment. So the, um, these three fetters are gone. A person who has done this with the teaching of the Buddha can never take another teacher, only the Buddha, will always know it's the Buddha that's the teacher and not anyone else who's um, explaining the Buddha's teaching. It's always the Buddha. Can no never again break any of the five precepts. So this is a very good criteria to check up on oneself. If one is breaking any of the five precepts, one hasn't had a past moment. And one, because there's nobody there to break them. There's no, there isn't enough of that um, self there to break them. And also, of course, the rebirth which one may experience, unfortunately, will not be below the human level. This is a guarantee. So we have found a safe spot. This is a safe spot. Until then, there's no safety at all. We can be reborn, we can have the most dreadful uh, results, we can have hell consciousness but for the stream enter that's no longer possible it's um, has to be human uh, as I already said maximum is seven rebirths but it can all be done in one lifetime and theoretically it can be done in one sitting but that may be going a bit far it's, um, it's such a purification that uh, one would probably take some more time. But one of the things which also happened for the stream enter is the fact that such a person is absolutely determined. They are not contented. They are not contented with stream entry. Because they know already from having experienced it, what it brings, but it's not enough. A person who has had stream entry will work and practice diligently to come to the end of all suffering. Because, you see, hate and greed have not been addressed yet. Hate and greed, which are our worst enemies, have had no um, bearing on the fetters which we have lost. So obviously a person who has lost some of the delusion, because delusion being the cause for hating greed, is not satisfied with that step. Although it is the most important step to take for any meditator, for any uh, spiritual pathway, the one who does it knows this is only beginning. 
Now altogether we have ten fetters. Interestingly enough, we get rid of only five on the first three steps. It's the Arahant who gets rid of the last five. So progressively it gets more difficult. The second one is called a once returner, Sakadagami. And it's the same process all over again. From a practical standpoint, one re-arouses the feeling of the fruit moment, which is a very important thing to do. One re-arouses the feeling of the fruit moment as often as one can. It's quite interesting that that is not spelled out like that so clearly. And yet, it is such an important aspect of the practice. Because that fruit moment is, of course, one where the me and the self-delusion was almost totally absent. Otherwise, there isn't that fruit. So we re-arouse that as much as, of, as often as possible, particularly after the jhanas, and send the mind off again to the place, to the uh, experience of the unconditioned, where there's nothing, nothing happening, one should say, maybe non-occurrence, not nothing, non-occurrence, nothing happening. And being able to have a second path moment one has actually more or less the same experience, but one could say that this wobbliness that came from jumping across there and not knowing exactly how to stand still is not apparent anymore. The mind is already used to this. And now we only have a reduction of hate and greed. It's not eliminated yet. Maybe we could say it's 50% of each. So anger becomes irritation and greed becomes preference. Now that's of course a big uh, advantage already, but it's still not enough. It's, um, one can see from that how enormously defiled the world is. It's the person who has had Nibbana for the second time is still not rid of hate and greed. So we should never again be surprised at the mess that we see amongst humanity. It's normal. It's natural. That's the way it is. It's not because somebody has gone berserk. or well, sure, people do go berserk. But it's not that at all. That's it. Without having the spiritual path and being able to see the reality of who's actually there, it's always going to be like that impossible to be otherwise. Now if we then look at the world from that standpoint, all that arises is compassion, that's all. But never again judgment, and never again that uh, feeling maybe of surprise why it is so bad, or never again that feeling of uh, that people must be specially bad in order to have these dreadful things happening. Nothing special about it. It's just the way it is. And when we see that quite clearly, of course the determination to get out of it becomes even more. Because the danger to fall into all that mess is always there. One wrong step and we're in it. Step can be physical, can be emotional. Now the once returner, Sakadagami, has not changed 
the um, ability to know uh, or the ability to feel this non-self within except when that person puts a mind on that experience the resurrection of the experience knows quite well what it feels like but otherwise just walks around nicely the way everybody else does but the defilements are less such a person is much easier to live with of course and uh, finds it easy to live with her or himself but is still not satisfied in fact, it's quite dissatisfied because it knows quite clearly that there's more to be done. So then we come to the next step, doing the same thing again, third time, and become a non-returner, anagami. Now the once-returner has to come back to the human level once in order to finish up. It's possible to get come back to one of the higher deva realms but it's not desirable this is the best realm to get enlightened because we have enough dukkha to do something about it the dukkha is our best teacher dukkha is the one that spurs us on i'm quite sure i'm correct if i say if we all didn't have dukkha we wouldn't be here what for why should we be here I could be at the beach but we've had dukkha and we know it so this is why the human realm is the best one for enlightenment so the one returner comes back once and the non-returner does not come back to the human realm the non-returner having been able to do the jhanas goes to any of the four brahma realms and finishes up there now the Brahma realms are not so desirable although they are the God realms and one should think that's very desirable because they are so enormously long lasting and the uh, so the um, such a person a non-returner uh, such a being I should say uh, will be stuck there for a long long time eons whatever eons are But, of course, it's very uh, full of sukkah there. There's no problems up there. I don't know if it's up there. Um, so, I guess the time goes fairly quickly. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a defilement, and you'll see in a minute why. The fetters which remain for the non-returner are five because the only fetters which are completely eradicated at this time are greed and hate no residue of them remains so you can see that we have now eradicated five but are still fettered by five and the ones that we are still having at that time are restlessness ignorance conceit and craving for rebirth either in the fine material realm or in the non-material realm so you see that craving for those two rebirths due to the fact that the self is not totally eradicated yet are still considered fetters even though that kind of rebirth would be far more beautiful than the rebirth in the human realm but that doesn't mean that such a person is conceited but what it means is that there is still the conceiving of me so what is said about the non-returner is that he or she has the 
conceiving of me still attached like the scent is attached to the flower the flowers a flower's aroma is still around the flower and so the me is still there for a non-returner and therefore it's called conceit that is still there and what is also still there because of that is restlessness because that too hasn't been totally eliminated because there's still that little bit of me there and also what is said it's there is ignorance which means it's the ignorance means that there's still a little me delusion so you can see what dreadful ignorance an ordinary person must have if a non-returner one step before Arahant still has ignorance. So this person that is able to uh, have the third step is able is also able to feel the no self practically any time much more than the first two steps practically any time because there are far less defilements that are obstructing that feeling you see in reality we all ha- we are all already there we have all this within everything we've got the jhanas within and we've got the insight and we've got the uh, enlightenment within but because we have also defilements they cover that up it's covered up by that and because of that because it's covered up we can't see it so the the each step reduces the defilements and as it reduces the defilements we come we can feel the reality the absolute reality much better so now such a person, a non-returner, can feel that reality that there's only a um, phenomena much better. But not all the time. Only the Arahant can. Only the Arahant, the fully enlightened one, can feel all the time that there's absolute emptiness within. That there's no person sitting within. As no me, no no male, no female, nothing. There's just everything is happening. And because the Arahant can no longer feel that there's me, he also makes no karma. We can only make karma if it's me thinking, saying and doing. So actually the non returner still makes karma but the Arahant makes no more karma. And that's a person who feels all the time that there's nothing at all within other than constant flux and flow, change of all, every phenomena. Every time we have a path moment and fruit, path and fruit always go together, There is a joy of attainment, um, not an achievement syndrome, but it's a real joy. It's a joy which um, is quite a pure joy. And then comes the reviewing. And that's a very important aspect, the reviewing. The reviewing is first like the recapitulation which I've often mentioned for the jhanas. What actually happened? Seeing clearly, oh yes, this is what I experienced for the past moment. This is what I experienced in the fruit moment. So that one is quite clear about it. And then one has to review the defilements within oneself as one encounters them in one's ordinary daily living 
review them whether in the case of the stream mantra whether they have been reduced somewhat they're certainly not eliminated but whether once defilements are reduced whether any of them have been abandoned and which ones are still there in other words one has to really know oneself is the only one that can know because even though we may not yell and scream at anybody we may still feel rejection, resentment, dislike so the only criteria of proof that we have whether we've actually done it or not is to check our own defilements and that's the reviewing knowledge and that reviewing knowledge is a very um, almost always an automatic thing that happens that one reviews oneself and sees what has happened and this reviewing goes on and on because the um, the defilements needs to one checks them automatically a person who has had the first step stream entry or second step has no other primary importance and no other activity of primary importance but to become enlightened it's uh, impossible that such a person would have anything else that they would find more important so obviously such a person would check their own defilements all the time now that doesn't bring any kind of unhappiness on the contrary it brings a great deal of happiness because one can see that they are getting less but it's also it brings a very strong determination to really make an end of it and it's only the arahant that has made an end of it and the words that are used when they're traditional words that are always used such a person understands destroyed his birth the spiritual life has been lived what had to be done has been done there's nothing further beyond this and uh, this is a traditional formula which uh, says which the arahant knows that this is it one has done it it's um, when the Buddha became enlightened he sat under the Bodhi tree in the, it says in the bliss of Nibbana for, for seven days well I would say in the bliss of the foot moment I guess for seven days and um, he just he uh, thought whether he should teach because he had a great deal of compassion for humanity who all didn't know the way out of Dukkha and then he thought again and he thought my teaching is much too profound people will not understand it and that will be a vexation for me and uh, so he decided not to teach and then the story says that the highest of the Brahmas the highest God came to see him probably in his consciousness and begged him to teach for the benefit of gods and men and so then he took a longer look and, and looked around with his um, clairvoyance and saw that there were some beings with little dust in their eyes and that they could understand in other words there were those that were ready for that so he decided to teach but I always found it very interesting that he thought it was going to be a vexation for him <laughs> because uh, after all one, one has this idea that an arahant doesn't feel anything but that's not so of course a person that's alive feels but there's no hate nor greed behind that feeling feeling is there but the reaction isn't there 
So the uh, he wouldn't be hateful for against anybody who was a vexation to him. Um, There's an interesting uh, simile given here also about one's practice. I'll read it out. In ancient times, people made use of a special implement to kindle a fire. It consisted of two pieces of wood, an upper kindling stick and a lower kindling stick. To kindle a fire, one had to go on rubbing the upper kindling stick against the lower one for a long time, unceasingly. If after rubbing the sticks together a few times until they became a little warm, one stopped to rest, one had to start the process all over again. Therefore, to make a fire with kindling sticks, one has to go on rubbing ceaselessly, however long it might take until fire is produced. The meditator has to proceed in the same way. He cannot succeed if he practices by fits and starts. He must apply himself to meditation without a break, until the supreme glo- goal of his endeavor is realized. I like this uh, two fire sticks. I mean, it doesn't help that we've got matches nowadays. <laughs> doesn't help at all. Also, it is said in one of the suttas that a person who has gained arahantship knows all the 37 factors of enlightenment without even trying. They are all available at, by just putting one's mind on it, which means also that, of course, the Noble Eightfold Path is part of the 37 factors of enlightenment that they are always available because they, the mind of such a person has become so purified that these are the things which are contained in the mind. And we have discussed all 37 factors of enlightenment here during this time. And uh, if you can't remember them, you can probably find them on the table. You can also ask. Here's another interesting aspect of um, the results of um, of having done the having had the path and fruit. He abides unattached, unfettered, uninfatuated, contemplating the peril in eye, ear, nose, so on. The five aggregates of grasping go on to future diminution. Now that's often misunderstood, that the five aggregates of grasping are becoming smaller. It's not that our body and mind become smaller, it's the grasping that becomes smaller. (laughs) They are called the five aggregates of grasping, the pancha, upadana, khandas. Pancha is five, upadana is clinging, and khandas are the aggregates. That's what they're called. They're called the five aggregates of clinging. They are, if we just look at the four of the mind, they are where the me arises because we're stuck to them. We cannot fathom that they're just arising until we have seen that. In the beginning we don't fathom that they're just arising. But when we've seen that, then we see. And so that is uh, minimized, that grasping. That craving which makes for re-becoming, which is accompanied by delight and lust, finding delight here and there, decreases. Bodily disturbances cease, mental disturbances cease. The bodily afflictions cease, mental afflictions cease. 
bodily distress ceases, mental distress ceases. And a meditator experiences physical and mental happiness. Whatever view such a one has becomes for him right view. Whatever intention, right intention. Whatever effort becomes right effort. Whatever mindfulness becomes right mindfulness. And whatever concentration becomes right concentration. But his bodily actions and verbal actions and livelihood have already been purified earlier. So this noble eightfold path comes to be perfected in him by this development. So this is the explanation of what I said earlier, that as such a person, having had the past moment, all four noble truths become clear, and the Arahant is the noble eightfold path. It is embodies, I should say, embodies the eight noble eightfold path. There's nothing other than that in such a person. Maybe that's enough for enlightenment, huh? <laughs> <laughs> if you have any questions, yes, Bob. Yes, you had said I, uh, some uh, persons become enlightened uh, in other ways or through other traditions. Or, but would they still have, but then you had said in an earlier talk that they still have the same experience. So does that mean they have to have insight? Uh, but they might have some other things happen in their tradition. Is that what you mean? Or, or well, but then they don't go by the Buddhist path, meaning they would go by whatever path they're on. Or? That's right. But the insight that there's nobody there that has to come. Okay. It, uh, that that is absolutely essential. Otherwise, there's no enlightenment. And that kind of insight has come to. Um, mystics on the Christian path and to um, sages on the Hindu path that there's nobody there and the practice path uh, can go another way it can go through the devotional aspects if they do the meditative path and the devotional aspect they'll do the jhanas but the insight that there's nobody there has to come whichever way they investigate that that doesn't matter I mean they can investigate it through the complete devotion and self surrender to um, the Christ complete self surrender that there's nothing left of that person or um, in Ramakrishna's the case it was the mother it's a complete self-surrender. But it has to, it goes along the same way. But it doesn't have to be along from the teaching of the Buddha. Uh, also, you had said, I think it was last night, that on some of the ja- in some of the jhana states, the person could go to enlightenment? Or I didn't quite Any. Uh, after the jhanas, it's always the best time to send the mind off to the unconditioned and it can be done after any the Buddha said one can even do it after the first jhana I only ha- I have my personal doubts on that but I mean because it may not be the mind concentrated enough but the Buddha mi- uh, said that because he would have assumed that the mind was perfectly concentrated but it can be done un- after any of the jhanas it is after the jhanas is always the best time because the mind is at, of a totally different um, nature then. So that is the time to send the mind off to the unconditioned if one has seen that the conditioned has nothing to offer. It cannot be a re- rejection of the world. That's not, that's not good enough. If that doesn't give me uh, a pleasure, I'll have something else at will. That doesn't work. It has to be seen with insight that this, what we have in the world, is actually all 
and the delusion. And then we can go there. So we can't exchange, you know, like going to the shop and get something better. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Micah. Um, Anya explained to me that um, one doesn't ask or one doesn't reveal the level of spiritual attainment beyond stream enterer. <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> In the Buddhist tradition. No. no, not beyond stream entra. I don't think so. You don't go around telling people, look at me, I'm a stream entra. You don't do that either. You don't tell anybody anything. I mean, that's an ego trip. Well, she said that uh, people openly discuss <laughs> their, their level of jhana attainment, but, I but said. you don't ask them. No. <laughs> in Buddhist tradition, we are not talking about the four steps of attainment, which is stream enter and once return and one return. That's what I said. But is it just because it's a, an ego trip, or is, is of course, there sure. what else? I'm not sure. My second question would be, um, in the case of someone like Trungpa Rinpoche, who's a known alcoholic, are we to, <laughs> well, I mean, that, that's pretty well accepted, I think. Um, are we to assume that he wasn't even a, a stream enterer? I, I think I gave up assuming some time ago, <laughs> especially about other teachers. I have no idea. What would I know about Trungpa? I have no idea. All I know is that he was a Tulku, which means he's a rebirth of a very high Lama. That's all I know. I've never met him, but I have a very good friend who is his disciple, and she knew all the things that he did, and she loved him dearly. That's all I know. she's a nun in his tradition. So that's all I can say. All I know is who is a stream enterer or anything beyond that, if they come and discuss it every step on the way with me. And I have never even met Trompa. And it certainly is quite true that one does not discuss these anything of these attainments with one's um, peers. One go tells one's teacher, of course, but not other people. If one tells anyone else, one, know, one has a direct uh, proof that it probably isn't so, because it's, um, you know, it's an uh, as ego assertion, and that wouldn't be very useful. And unfortunately, we don't give, get a halo or anything, so. <laughs> <laughs> and the word holy just means whole anyway. That's all it means, just to be whole. No longer fragmented. And that was, then one is holy, one is whole. The Buddha had a very pragmatic kind of teaching and very much lacking in all sorts of, uh, which we find very much in, often in other religions, we find a lot of um, um, explanations of things that we cannot really um, connect to ourselves. But in the Buddha's teaching, all of it is available to us. All we have to do is practice, that's all. Anything else? Yes? To, to get to stream entry, it's basically right morality, a lot of concentration, and enough insight. To get to each of the other steps is 
cleaning up the morality act more more concentration and more insight mm. basically on the same thing the same the jhanas being the, the concentration aspect and the 10 12 whatever number of insight steps that you discuss being the mm. insight to work on the the insight steps do become deeper as we go on you know you might think one day and one does that, oh, I can see impermanence quite clearly. It's, you know, and a year later, it has a totally different connotation. Or ten days later, or five days later, it has, it's, um, it's all pervading. The inside steps become all pervading in the whole of the universe or in the whole oneself. So it is a matter of deepening the inside. The concentration, yes, Possibly, but the concentration may be already be all right then. It's a, it's probably the most important step is the deepening of the inside. And it's basically the the inside of the nitya dukkha not the, that's it. There's mm. no new insights to pick up for any new steps or anything like that. No, right. it's a deepening of it where it, uh, it becomes so clear that there's nothing to do except let it all go. Next year's work, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, will you please say something about the God principle being the same as the enlightenment principle? Well, that's possible that it is the same, but not necessarily so. You see, Meister Eckhart said, God exists because the creature exists, but behind God there is a Godhead. Now that's the enlightenment principle. But he was not understood, and to this day is not understood. He's very difficult, obviously, to understand. And also, he was not theologically uh, in accordance with the Catholic Church, so his teaching was suppressed, and he was almost burned at the stake. Well, he wasn't, but almost. So. When you see that God exists because the creature exists, that's fine. Behind God the Godhead, yes, that's fine. But if you just say the God principle, what do you mean by the God principle? Who knows? Who knows what the God principle is? It depends what everybody understands about it. You see, there's no question what the enlightenment principle is. The enlightenment principle is explained exactly by, by the Buddha. But the God principle was never explained exactly. It was always used, I and my father are one, or my father in heaven, and whatever. Uh, all wasn't explained. So it depends how much insight there is. Now, Meister Eckhart, probably the greatest of all Christian mystics, um, to my understanding, my personal understanding, was enlightened. I can't see it any other way. But this is a personal view and may be quite wrong. Because views are all wrong. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But the way he explained it was his constant theme, which was going as like a thread through the whole of his uh, sermons, was always um, lose your, your self give up yourself, do not be um, separate. And that was his constant theme. So he was certainly teaching in that direction. But the kind of God principle that's going around in churches, on pulpits, in sermons, may not be the enlightenment principle. Sorry? Yes, yes, exactly. And also, (coughs) it seems to be something which has a a power over us. I mean, if that were so, it's a rather unfortunate happening, isn't it? It doesn't seem to work very well. So that kind of God principle is not well explained and not well understood. But if it is... uh, 
used in the way Meister Eckhart did, yes, certainly. It's right there. It's, uh, it can be found in any religion, the enlightenment principle. It doesn't matter, it's just different words is used, different terminology. But it has to be much more profound than what is usually in everyday kind of explanations. Anything else? Put your attention on the breath for just a few moments, please. Visualize yourself on the beach, walking along the ocean waves. Feel the sunshine, feel the sand under your feet. Listen to the sound of the ocean waves. Let peace and joy arise in your heart. Fill and surround yourself with it. Think of the person sitting next to you. Let him or her come to the beach and walk together in peace. Fill him or her with joy, with happiness. Now let all the people in this room join this walk in noble silence, filling and surrounding each other with happiness and joy. Think of your parents, whether they're alive or not. 
forgive them for whatever they might have done to you knowing that we're all subject to greed, hate and delusion so forgive them Walk together with them in peace, sharing your understanding, your friendship. Think of the people dearest and nearest to you. Invite them to walk with you on the beach. Fill and surround them with peace, with joy and happiness. Now invite all the people you know to walk this pilgrimage of peace together. Sharing in joy, in happiness and understanding. There might be someone whom you don't like so much at this moment. Someone you have had an argument with. Thank this person for being your teacher. Teaching you about your reactions. Open your heart towards this person. Let him or her walk together with you in peace, in understanding.
Think of people who have far more difficulties than we have. The homeless people here in Berkeley, in San Francisco. People without food or shelter everywhere in the world. Children dying of starvation. Handicapped people. people in prisons, send them all the peace you have in your heart. The more you can give, the more you've got. Think of people far and near. Here in this country and overseas. Picture as many as you can. And let them walk the pilgrimage of peace together. filling and surrounding each other with understanding and friendship. Put your attention back on yourself. Feel the calm of peace in your heart. The warmth of joy. Keep it there. May beings everywhere have peace in their hearts.